Bibles to Acts chapter 15 tonight. Acts chapter 15. down to verse 13, please. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I'll build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled, and from blood. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us tonight as we look at this important truth regarding things that Gentiles need to obey. And I pray that you would just enlighten our hearts and our eyes and our minds and understanding. And God, I pray that the result of what we learned this evening would be liberating as well as Father obligatory. That we would see uh, what our duty is in order to live for Jesus. So we pray in His name. Amen. Well, in our series on transcendent truth, a lot of the topics that we have been approaching, uh, though some of them may be more or less exciting, many of those topics that we've looked at, I believe are truths where Christians, if they get right, take the next step or go to the next level, or if you want to use the phrase, turn the corner and get beyond where they've been before and never go back. If they get them wrong, Oftentimes, they're the place where they hit the ceiling and either stop or uh, start the downward trajectory in order to, uh, and, and don't go on in their Christian faith. There are a lot of those things in the lives of believers. One of the things we've been emphasizing in our series is that the devil is uh, not a Johnny come lately. He's not lately come onto the scene. He's been uh, working for quite a few years now. Uh, we know about about 6,000 years uh, that the devil has been doing what he does. He's got an advantage on everybody. Have you all noticed that there's just something about the person who's been at it longer that they just seem to have a little bit of an advantage? It's sort of the why, you know, you've got little brother syndrome. Little brother can never be big brother at wrestling. Why is that? Well, because he's big brother. Little brother can get bigger than big brother, stronger than big brother, more skilled at big brother. Little brother can out-wrestle anyone else in the world except for big brother, but he'll never beat big brother. There's just something about that. And the reality of it is this, my friend. The Satan has been walking, roaming to and fro, and seeking whom he may devour for a lot of years. And you don't have to look out for one thing in life. It isn't just one thing that will get you. It's any of the things, but all it takes is one thing to supplant you or to stop you from moving on in your faith. The devil can't touch you. He can't touch your soul. He can't harm you. Uh, what his goal is, he's not going to, to uh, steal you from God and uh, take you to hell. What his goal is, or really what all he wants to do, is just to render you useless or incompetent. And there are a lot of places, a lot of areas, particular areas of obedience in the Christian life where if you make a wrong decision or come out believing something other than what the Bible teaches, It'll just turn you. You'll turn and go the wrong direction in life, and it'll render you useless for Jesus Christ. Let me remind you, believer, that we are not here for our own pleasure. God made you for a purpose. Do you realize that? Is that meaningful to you? You know, sometimes I think we have uh, bought into 
selfishness to such a great degree that we're actually not even interested in God's purpose. In other words, when we talk about purpose, we talk about what is our purpose? What is my purpose? And we almost resent the notion that God has a plan for us because we think that it's somehow contrary to our plan for us. And so many times we don't want God's purpose for us because we think it's going to take away from our purpose. My friend, you misunderstand God. Uh, God knows what's best for you, and God's purpose is so much better for you than any purpose you could have that living out what God created you for is the only way in life that you'll ever be satisfied, that you'll ever know joy, and that you'll ever accomplish anything that makes your life worth living, finding God's purpose. And so the devil tries to get us subverted. And so we've looked at a lot of things. Last week, one of the transcendent truths that we looked at was the matter of the Lord's Day. Just the matter of the Lord's Day. And there are a lot of people that are whacked out on the matter of the Lord's Day. And you say, Pastor, well, you know what? I don't know if it's a big deal whether you worship on, on the Sabbath or on the first day of the week. Well, you'd be surprised at how that becomes the hallmark or the benchmark or the distraction of folks that don't. Uh, yesterday on, on Soul Winning, Luke and I, when we were headed back to the bus, we saw a guy standing on a sidewalk and we tried to give him a gospel tract and he did take it. And then I invited him to church and he said, I, I asked him, where do you go to church? And he said, well, uh, I go to Seventh-day Adventist church. And do you know something? Uh, I'm not against Seventh-day Adventists. I don't some, I believe that there are Seventh-day Adventists who are born again. But you know an entire denomination has been developed around that false doctrine of not understanding the, the Lord's Day and what the Lord's Day is. Right. An entire denomination has been built around the notion that we have got to keep the law to some degree, even though we're part of the church. And my friend, that's a false doctrine. And when you get off on a false doctrine, that's all you're about. I have a few times heard Seventh-day Adventist preachers preach, and do you know what I've heard them preach about? Saturday. The Sabbath day. You know what else they preach about? Chicken, pork, lobster, shrimp, unclean meat, animals that you're not supposed to eat. In other words, keeping the law. Don't they say anyone who worships on Sunday is going to hell? That's the mark of the beast. Uh, Tony, I'm sure they say that, but they never said it to me. <laughs> okay. My, my point is, I don't want to get distracted on what Seventh-day Adventists talk about, but if you want to get wrong about a doctrine, it's all you'll talk about. And if you focus on a false doctrine, that begins all becomes all that you preach about and all that you talk about, what are you going to accomplish with regard to what Jesus told us to do? What did Jesus tell us to do? He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach them what? Well, the things I have commanded you. So teach those things. But then he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And you know, if you get off on one of those things, you'll be teaching people your false doctrine, but you won't be teaching people the gospel. You won't be preaching the gospel. And we as believers have to be careful. Even sometimes what we're right about can subvert us or the, the Satan can use it as a distraction to keep us from focusing. F uh, doctrine is foundational for us to be right in order to accomplish Christ's purpose for us. Okay, so here we are in Acts chapter 15 this week. And I want to just focus... Let me unplug this. That's a distraction for me. Uh, I want to just focus on this matter of Christian liberty from a biblical perspective. There are two perspectives on Christian liberty, aren't there? You know, you about, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? You ever met a Christian who, anytime you try to tell them the Bible says we ought to or ought to do something, they say, oh, that's the law. That's the law. I have a family member in our family, and my dad would, uh, sometimes this person would be talking about, we're going to do this and this and this, and dad would say, you know, the Bible says, because they're a Christian, the Bible says we should, oh, there you go again, bringing us under the law. Yes, just the law. You're trying to put us under the law. We have liberty in Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, that same person, when they thought something was wrong and didn't fit their narrative, uh, then they didn't mind a law. But whenever it was anything they disagreed with, they were all about, oh, it's liberty in Jesus Christ. You know, we're not under the law. 
And we know what about the Bible. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that uh, the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. So, how much of the Bible is useful for a believer? All of it is. Every, every bit of it, right? Isn't it so? Okay, so... Do we take the law and do we scrap it? Do we throw it away? Do we say it has no value? Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. Matter of fact, uh, let, me ask, let me ask an opposite question. Are we under the law? <laughs> no, we're not either. And it seems sometimes, doesn't it, as though those two truths are opposites, doesn't it? You ever think, okay, we're not under the law, but the law is useful. Wait, if we're not under, what use is it? Well, we're not under... See what I'm saying? We kind of go back and forth as a Christian. And you know, it's interesting to me how that Christians cherry-pick the parts of the law they like. Isn't it so? Yeah, Christians, they, yeah. You know, some Christians are all about this uh, truth that's in the law, but they disregard other truths, and when it's the part they want, they're very, very strong about the Word of God says. And when it's the part that is not convenient for them, then it's... Well, we're, we're not under the law. And sometimes as believers, we can get confused about that, can we not? Well, I want to just give you this evening a simple tool. Okay, just a simple tool uh, through which to, to uh, filter truth or to filter uh, the Scripture, the Word of God. And I'm not preaching this evening, I, although it probably would be a, a good message on being under the law and uh, preaching about grace in the Old Testament. It would, be, it would be a good series, I think, to preach on. I have preached on that in the past. But I want to just give you a little tool to help you discern what to do with the law or with uh, Bible truth. Okay? So, the scenario we're in in Acts chapter 15 is this mess that's been created by the apostles who shared the gospel uh, with the folks down in Antioch. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, I've heard, anybody ever heard somebody say, you know, until you live for Jesus, you're not really called a Christian. You know, Christian, believers were called Christians first at Antioch because that's when they really became known as the followers of Jesus. Well, that's partly true. But actually the reason that believers became called Christians at Antioch was because they lost their identity as a sect of Judaism and uh, the identity was replaced with the reality that they were followers of Jesus. So it's partly true in that they were followers of Jesus, but they were no longer Jewish believers in Jesus only. Now, it wasn't that they excluded the Jews, but the folks at Antioch were all Gentiles. And God did a mighty work in Antioch, and the apostles went there, and the folks in Antioch received the power of the Holy Ghost, and they demonstrated the same fruits in Christ as the Jewish believers did. And so they were powerfully saved. There was a a stirring church in work, and it really began the fire of the ch of the church spreading throughout the world. It really began that part of you know the you know, Judea and Samaria, and then uttermost part of the earth. Antioch began the uttermost part of the earth part. From that portion of Acts forward, we see that the gospel is spread to the Gentile nations, and that the Gentile nations even uh, reciprocate by supporting the believers in Jerusalem and taking care of the original believers, but no longer was Christianity discovered or considered uh, by those inside, by some inside the church and by others outside the church as a sect of Judaism. Before, you were a Jew that, you know, followed that Jesus. And after this, how can you call a Gentile a Jew when he's not Jewish? He's a follower of Jesus, and so he's a Christian. And the Gentiles weren't Jewish. First of all, they weren't steeped in religious tradition, as were the Pharisees. Most of the early church was filled with Pharisees who were believers, and they knew the law, and they knew the traditions, and they were steeped in the law. But the Gentile believers had no background of that. They were idolaters. Their worship was pagan and wicked, their worship involved primarily uh, perversions, uh, sexual perversions, and also uh, 
human sacrifices, just the things that their worship involved was just wicked. And so, as believers, the Gentiles, they didn't have a clue about washing hands and things that are clean and things that are unclean. They didn't have that background. And so now that they're saved, the Jewish believers are like, well, we've got to turn them into Christians. And so they started bringing them, you know, they said, okay, you need to get circumcised. Uh, you need to, you know, you need to keep the Sabbath holy. You need to, and they started giving them a list of things. Primarily, circumcision and the Sabbaths were the two major things that the Jews felt like. If you're really a follower, Sophia, you can't play with the babies. I cannot pay attention when you make faces at and play with them. Shame on you. All right, he's never going to learn how to behave in church. Okay, all right. Hey, you leave her alone. <laughs> right. I straighten him out. You see? I'm sorry he got you in trouble. I'll get him next time. Okay. <laughs> Alright, now, so now the, the, the believers, the Jewish believers, are, they are completely uh, trying to put the Gentiles under the law. They're trying to get them, you know, to look like good Jewish believers, like proselytes, like Jewish proselytes. But the only thing is, is that we're not proselytes. We're born again. We're Gentiles, we're other nations. And so what had happened was that there had arisen a great conflict in Antioch. The Judaizers uh, were really trying to put a burden on the Gentiles. I'm sure some of the Gentiles were trying to comply and realizing the same thing that the lost Gentiles real, or lost Jews realized. We can't keep the law. You remember when you were first saved? I hope this is true for you. When you were first saved, didn't you just want to know everything God wanted you to do and do it? Mm, sure. I mean, you, God said it. I believe it. That settles it, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the way it should be? So you have a Gentile believer and he's born again. And uh, man, get circumcised. Okay. Uh, man, uh, you need to keep the Sabbath day. Okay. You need to, you need to, you need to. And all of a sudden, the Gentiles kept having things added on and pretty soon they're just like, they're failing. And they're thinking, man, I don't think I can be Jewish. It's too much. And they didn't have to be Jewish. They weren't required to be Jewish. And so what happened was the apostles went back, the, the church that they had been sent out was at Jerusalem. and They went back to Jerusalem and they gave a report. They said, you need to stop sending these people over to Antioch and messing with the Christians there. That's sort of the message that Paul and Silas and Barnabas brought back. If you read Acts 15, they said, you need to leave the believers in Antioch alone and uh, let them just live for Jesus and stop trying to be Jews. And so Paul gave testimony. Uh, Peter gave testimony of the evidence that the Holy Spirit lived in the Gentiles without their keeping the law. Paul reminded them, as he had reminded Peter at a different time, of the reality that the Jews couldn't keep the law, so how in the world can the Gentiles keep it? See, the Jews need to be saved because they couldn't keep the law, and Gentiles got saved, and the Jews are trying to make them keep the law. That's the way we are sometimes, isn't it? Every one of us is that way, by the way. Ask Anthony. Anthony, how often do I make you do the dishes? Every day? How often do I do the dishes? What's that? About once a week, he says. Yeah. He's probably about right. It's about right. Now, I don't let him go to bed at night unless the dishes are done. That's my standard for Anthony. <laughs> Man, you got it tough. <laughs> hey, we don't want bugs in our house. We want... We want and, and we don't want to get a pile for when Mrs. Price gets home on Saturday. We're going to be in a lot of trouble if we don't have the dishes done when she gets home on Saturday. And we don't want to be scrambling last minute trying to make it happen. So we got to, you know, we got to stay, stay circumspect on this matter. But you know we're all like that a little bit. I'm a lot more ready to tell him, man, you better get them dishes done than I am to do the dishes myself. Probably all you say, dishes. Pastor, what? Probably all his dishes he's always eating. Yeah. That's 90% true. Yeah. It's 90% true. The boy's gained about 25 pounds in the last couple of months. Oh, wow. So he's, uh, he's healthy, Good. you could say. Uh, <laughs> but the reality of it is is that uh, I'm pretty healthy myself. And when it comes, when it comes to eating with the two of us, we get along pretty well. Uh, we we, we complement each other in that area. Uh, the reality of it is is that what I'm trying to say is that most of the time we're pretty ready to tell somebody else what they ought to do. Y'all are like that. Anytime I do work around the church, 
somebody comes and tells me more work that I had to do around the church. <laughs> I'm serious. Anytime somebody comes and sees a project, they very rarely say, hey, it's nice that we got that done. Good job. Mm. They say, you know what you really ought to do. <laughs> so they we're like that. It's in our nature, isn't it? It's the way we are. And so uh, we got to watch out for that. And they had that problem in the early church. Paul and the apostles went back to Jerusalem and said, you need to stop these guys trying to make Jews out of Gentiles. Jesus didn't make Jews out of them, and so we shouldn't either. Now that's a big summary. Let's look at some of the things that the Scripture said. And I want to help to settle you uh, in knowing this because it didn't go one, of the, one way or the other. They didn't say, you guys, you can just do whatever you want to do. Let's go ahead and look at what James said. Okay? In James, or James said in verse 18 of Acts 15, he said, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is, that we trouble not them which are which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. And he said, let's not trouble the Gentiles. God has always had a plan to save the Gentiles. That's what he said. Has that always been God's plan? Yes. He said, yes. God wanted to save the Gentiles. It's his plan. And then verse 20, he said, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. What, what's that mean? We're not in James. This is James talking. I tricked several of you, but this is James speaking. We're in Acts 15. Acts 15, and it was yes. Okay, so Acts 15, let's let's go back to verse 20. So James said, We're not going to trouble the Gentiles. He said, But what? But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication, from things strangled and from blood. And it's interesting uh, that. In verse 22, we see, we see the way that the church decides things. First of all, they had apostolic authority. We do not today. Our apostolic authority today is the Scripture. Uh, the apostles and prophets are the Word of God today. But verse 22, Then it pleased the apostles with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, their name Barabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And the brethren, the brethren. Verse 23, And they wrote letters by them after this manner. Here's the letter. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must keep circumcised, be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Oh, what are strong words, aren't they? It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood, and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves... Ye shall do well, fare ye well. And so in short, Paul and Barnabas, along with, with uh, Silas and uh, Judas, went back to Antioch, delivered the message. Silas had such a great time there. He's from Jerusalem, but things went so well there that he stayed in Antioch. And that became his new church home, and those became his brethren, those men that he came to and ministered to. But this is the letter. Now let me ask you a question. Did the church at Jerusalem write a letter indeed saying, you are not under the law, you're free from the law? Did they write a letter saying that? Is that the gist of the letter? Yeah. Huh? Yes. yes, they did. Did they write a letter saying, you don't need to worry about anything, you can do whatever you like? No. 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 And see, therein is the crux, biblically speaking. You know, some Christians can't understand the difference between being under the law and do, 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 do in order to be righteous versus being holy. Versus being in Jesus Christ. What were the Gentiles saved out of? Idolatry, fornication, and the things that had to do with that. Eating things strangled and... Whoa, what they eat? What's blood? Sorry. It's, it's, it's blood? Uh, Drinking blood? Sure. Yes, uh, well, for instance, a lot of uh, South America, a lot of cultures have blood recipes like uh, pudding, 
uh, what do they call the, uh, when they drain the blood out of the chicken and they make like a pudding out of it, the Brazilians have a dish that's, uh, that's blood. Uh, well, you may think it's disgusting, but it's delicious, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to shock you all so much. But people eat disgusting things all around the world. <laughs> it's just true. And they like it. Okay? Sorry. Man, y'all got some interesting perspectives tonight. Uh, yes, people ate blood and liked it. And it was part of worship. But there was a pagan, uh, there was a Satanism, a paganism to it as well, wasn't there? See, the fact of the matter is that any occult or any worship that is. Uh, idols and all idols are satanic. They're all about blood, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're all about things that are disgusting that have to do with blood. Do you think cannibalism is just because human meat is tasty? Uh, I don't think so. It's satanic. It's there are a lot of I, there's a lot of idolatry, a lot of pagan, wicked association involved with it. Uh, let's go ahead and just make sure that we understand this. Okay, so let me ask you a practical question. The fornication, the blood, the idolatry, the things that are mentioned here, the things that believers are not to do, they're to abstain from meat offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. Okay, they're told not to do that, right? Mm -hmm. All right, was that just a one-time command on the basis of the roots of it or was that actually a scriptural, biblical, New Testament order. Look at Acts chapter 21, will you please? <laughs> Acts chapter 21. This is Paul when he's ready to go to Jerusalem. He's going to take his vow. And uh, they're telling him the things that he's been accused of. Look at verse 25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Now is there, we can read this entire context, but is there a very clear scriptural command for believers not to participate in eating things that are strangled and from blood and from being uh, fornicators? Is, is the Bible clear about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, isn't it? Okay, now go to Romans chapter 14, will you please? Romans chapter 14. This is where everybody preaches and teaches that God doesn't have an opinion about anything and whatever you like, you can do. By the way, 14, chapter 14 doesn't end the context. Paul said in chapter 14, Verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and other uh, who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Uh, and who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up. And one man esteemeth one day above another. I'm sorry, for, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Verse 6, He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he... He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Now let's stop there. How many of you have really internalized verse 7 of Romans 14? No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. In a nutshell, it's very, very clearly teaching that no one lives a life which doesn't affect someone else. I don't know how many people think that I've met, think that what they do is only about them. My friend, if you think that, you're first of all the most selfish person in the world. The only reason you think that what you do only affects you is because you're the only person you care about. No 
because it's actually true. The only reason you think that your actions don't affect anyone else, don't discourage or encourage someone else in their faith, is because you're the only person you care about. And that's the only reason why, because the fact is what you do does affect others. You'd be amazed at how much your life turns people away from Jesus or turns people to Jesus. Both saved and lost. No man liveth on himself, no man dieth unto himself. And the scripture here in Romans chapter 14 in teaching Christian liberty is saying you're free to do this or not to do this, but remember this. No one does anything that doesn't affect someone else. Everything that you do will affect somebody, either for, to, toward Jesus or away from Jesus. It'll turn someone to or from. In verse 8, he said, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we're there, we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Uh, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Now, set it not means to stop or to hinder. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now let me ask you a question. The matter of meat offered to idols, it's covered in Romans 14. The matter of meat offered to idols. Would that have been a stumbling block for a Jew? Yeah, eh, maybe. maybe. What if a Jew realized that he never kept the law, never could keep the law, and idols weren't anything to him? I'll be quite honest with you. I've never been intrigued by any idol. And you say, Pastor, things can be idols. Cars can be idols. Boats can be idols. You know, things we possess. I understand that we can give something the place that belongs to God. But what I'm speaking about is actual idols, like Diana, or the gods of the, the god of the Ephesians, uh, an actual idol. A, gent a Gentile would be far more greatly affected by meat offered to idols than a Jew would, to be quite frank, for good or for evil. If you were to come to dinner, and you were, or you were to have a Gentile over to dinner, and you were a a Jewish believer, and you had meat that was offered to idols, and you believed in Christian liberty. You just believed, well, you know what? Um, God's clan called things clean, and I'm not going to call them common. And the Bible does teach that. Uh, if you believe that, and you, in conversation, were talking to the Gentile guest, and he said, so where, man, this is good. Where'd you get it? And you said, well, you know, I was in the marketplace, and it was right after the sacrifice, and boy, they were, you know, the idol didn't eat the meat. Because they never do. Uh, so I did. Y'all ever gone to a Chinese restaurant and seen a little idol there with an orange or something on it? Y'all ever been tempted to grab the orange peel it and eat it? He's not going to eat that thing, man. It's going to rot there. He's, he's not into it. You can go to Japan. You can go to the graves where they have ancestor worship, and they're all putting food out for their ancestors and, and all that. You know what? It would be a good place if it's fresh to go get something to eat because those ancestors aren't hungry. You know, and I'm being a little bit silly here this evening, but the reality of it is is that an idol isn't anything in actuality, is it? It actually, you say, Pastor, those idols represent something. Well, it's all about, about Satan worship, but the reality of it is that they're not real. They represent something real, but they're not real. They're made with man's hands. And so could I eat meat offered to an idol? Would it mean much to me? Might. Might. But it wouldn't mean to me what it does to a Gentile. Patty, have some sass? Yeah, in Walmart they have that meat. Halal? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't I touch it. Touch. Yeah. yeah. What about kosher? I don't know what kosher is. Right? Yeah. It's the same, right? Isn't it like supposed to be clean meat? It's prayed over by a priest. Yeah. Oh, it's well, prayed over by a, uh, not a priest, but a, uh, rabbi. But a rabbi. Yeah. But, yeah. The, but they're Jewish. Sure, they're Jewish, but what are Jews that aren't in Jesus? A bunch of pagans. You ever you ever examine Judaism today? Compare it with what the Judy what the what the law taught? No, I thought they were trying to keep the law. 
unfortunately, most of what they do is not in the Scripture. It's Judaism today is a pagan religion. Uh, we find the institution uh, of the synagogue system. You know, the synagogue system of worship instead of the temple and instead of sacrifices. Find the Levitical high priest who are offering a sacrifice once a year in Judaism today. None of that's involved. They have works substituted for it. And the kosher that they keep violates, violates the law as well. And so, so it's, as, it's as pagan as, as halal is. So those hot dogs are you those kosher hot dogs. See, if you're going to ask the question, you're going to have to answer it and satisfy your conscience. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but here's the deal. If a rabbi has prayed, has prayed over it, did he pray to Jesus? No. 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 If he rejected the Son, is, is, does he believe in the Father? No. Then who did he pray to? Huh? The devil. It wasn't God. Am I wrong, Charlie? Charlie Charlie's the one that started this whole conversation. <laughs> right. So uh, <laughs> no, I just like picking on Charlie. Yeah. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying? In other words, meat offered to idols, we have it today, actually, don't we? Yeah. So you want to say halal, but uh, you know halal, you know, Islam is as, as legitimate as Judaism today. Did you hear me? I'm not being anti-Semitic and I'm not being anti-Muslim. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus is God. If you reject Jesus as God, my friend, what's the difference? What's the difference? Yeah. Jews have more truth. They have more truth, but it isn't the truth. And if you study Judaism and you look at what they believe, 99% of Judaism has nothing to do with the Scripture. The Jews believe in the authority of the Scripture as much as the Catholics do. And I'm not going to get into Catholicism this evening as well, but I, I'm just I'm making broad, sweeping blanket statements about paganism. And Judaism is a pagan religion every bit so much as Islam is or as uh, much as Catholicism is because all of those are an institution of worship as an alternative to truth. Amen. And that's the reality. Oh, they're just pagan. And uh, the motive behind it is, I don't want to keep God's law. Now, isn't that why truth matters? We can't just believe whatever we want to. And if, if the worship system, the question specifically you asked, Patty, and the answer to it, if the worship system of the, Jew, of the Jews today isn't legit, what is it? It's idolatry. It's instead of Jesus. And so if they had a temple where the Holy... Uh, holy was inhabited by God, they'd be legitimate. If they had the high priest, the sacrificial system, and so forth, but they do not. And so you know that their system of worship, we could get into where did that get started. Uh, it was already present, that worship system of the rabbinical uh, worship system was already there. Where, where are the words, or where are the rabbis, where is it taught how to have, the, to have a rabbi-led religion? In the, in the Old Testament of Scripture. We see rabbis, which means teacher, we see rabbis and their usage in the New Testament of the Scripture leading uh, sects of Judaism, either the Pharisees or the Sadducees or other groups. But where does the Bible teach this is how you worship? No. They're supposed to have the Levites leading in the worship and leading in the temple and serving in the temple. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so Judaism in Christ's day was not legitimate either. And there are more questions that you're going to have because of that statement I made, but that isn't the message this evening. I want to help you guys to be able to get an answer to the question I asked at the beginning, which is it? We're not under the law, we don't have to worry about anything, or we're under the law, we need to be conscious and aware of everything. What is it? We need to answer that question. Verse 14 of... Romans 14, he said, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Okay. One year I'm going to remember to schedule into our church calendar a Passover. I'd like to have a Passover in our church for us to see Christ in the Passover. 
Christ is in the Passover, and it's it's an important, uh, true Jewish celebration that can be practiced the right way. I have many Christian friends who skip church the week of the Passover to participate with their family and friends in the Passover. Now stop for a second with me and think about this. What is the Passover to somebody who isn't in Jesus? Now you say, oh pastor, oh pastor, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. I know that. But when you celebrate the Passover with someone who has rejected Jesus, what is the Passover? It's exactly what it is in their mind, and that's what you've acknowledged to them. Well, not with unbelievers. Right? Now, there's a connection there, and I don't want to go too far, but there's a connection why we don't take participate in the Lord's Supper with unbelievers. Right? Do you understand the connection there? Does that naturally follow the logic of that? Okay. Um, now, in verse 15, If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now, I know Christians who say, Well, Pastor, I would offend my family so much. I'd offend my family so much if I didn't spend Passover with them. You offend your Christian family more. And you offend Jesus a lot more. See, there's a matter of charity, charitably behaving. See, I could participate in something that meant nothing to me. I could eat a Cadbury egg. I didn't this year. I'm mad at eggs. I've been mad at them for a while because of the whole paganism. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just so aggravated with churches that have Easter egg hunts. I'll be honest with you. I know you all don't come to our church on Easter, so you can go somewhere else to an Easter egg hunt. But let me just tell you something. I know Taj does for sure. Yeah. I'm just ticked off because it's so pagan, it's so wicked, and, and Christians bring it into the church. And I, we're not all, any of us perfect about anything. Halloween is another one. The church is celebrating Halloween with their trunk or treats or their, you know, their festivals that celebrate that. That is so wicked and so pagan, and the, and the unsaved people know it. And Christians are just participating in it as though it's, you know, um, they just don't want to miss out. They don't want to miss the fun, the party. But it's wicked. And Jesus is more offended by it than I am. I'm certain of that. And I just think of what an insult it is to Jesus. For a Christian on Resurrection Sunday to have an Easter egg hunt that uh, is all about the goddess Diana and fornication and uh, fertility. Seriously? For a Christian to take a day that's unto the Lord and to do something pagan on it? It's just wicked. And we as believers ought to be careful about giving you say, well, Pastor, you're the weaker brother in that instance. No, I'm not. Not at all. See, I could eat a Cadbury egg, and it wouldn't mean anything to me. It'd just be an egg with some chocolate and some caramel in it. But it isn't that to a lot of people. Not if you're a pagan. And they know it. And so ought we. Do you understand there's a clear principle here? Or just, you know, sometimes we think, well, it's a little bit gray. It's a little bit blurred. Not really, actually. If I don't participate in Easter eggs on Resurrection Sunday, is any Christian going to be misled? Huh? What if, what if I'm so dogmatic about it that I actually bother other Christians into not playing with eggs on Resurrection Sunday? Will they be hurt by that? What? I said, I don't know. Is that what Jesus would do? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think so. What if that were the result? of Would that harm anybody? No. What if we had a couple Christians that didn't have clarity about it and we had an Easter egg hunt here? That might hurt someone. You understand the principle there? No man lives unto himself. No man dies unto himself. And a person that regards the day regards it unto the Lord, and a person that doesn't regard a day doesn't regard it unto the Lord. It's about Jesus. Do you see that? Paul said, it's about Jesus. 
And if I turn someone away from Jesus, I'm a stumbling block. And if I turn someone to Jesus, there is no length that I have to go to in order to accomplish that. What could I give up or what could I participate in that would be too much or too little for Jesus? The answer is nothing. Jesus is worth anything. Liberty isn't about, here's the law, here are the rules, or there's no law, there are no rules. It's about understanding the difference between trying to earn our justification and being justified. So if I'm holy, if I have been made holy, I have the right to be holy. If I'm holy and I live as though I'm holy, I am not the source of my holiness. It's the blood of Jesus that made me holy. But I have the right to live like what I am because of what Jesus has done. See, we cross a line, we turn the wrong direction or we get off in our trajectory when we think that holiness comes from what we do. We're saved by grace. We live by grace because of what Jesus has done. And it's that practical. It's that simple. So should a Christian who's a Gentile eat meat off her idols? Well, Acts 15 says not to. Paul brings it up. And he concludes this. In verse 19, he said, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. He said, For meat, destroy not the work of God. Now, is there anything that you could have, that you could participate in, that you enjoy, that is worth subverting the work of God? And sometimes Christians, boy, they put burdens on us, don't they? I've told this story before. I'll tell it again before we finish this evening. It used to be when we were on Federal Highway, a bunch of us used to like to go down to McDonald's, uh, the one on Federal Highway on US-1, after church on Sunday night. We'd worship all day, and then Sunday night we'd go down to McDonald's, and they had 39-cent hamburgers and 59-cent cheeseburgers. They're poison. Those things are terrible. <laughs> but they're cheap. And so we would go and buy a tray full of them. I mean, just put a big tray full of them. And Mike Huckabee was on at the time with his Huckabee show. And uh, we kind of, we didn't really watch Mike Huckabee. We kind of watched, we just yelled Huckabee a lot because there were a lot of Democrats in there that didn't like Mike Huckabee. And we just had a great time down there. And we did that every Sunday night. It wasn't our rule. It wasn't why we, you know, it wasn't, you know, this is what our church did. But we just did it. It just started happening. We started doing it. New guy came to church and he went with us. And he called me during the week. He said, I need to talk to you about something. I said, okay, sure. We scheduled a meeting. I didn't know what it was. What to talked to me about. He said, you know, he said, I just, I feel like that we should worship Jesus on the Lord's Day. I said, I think you're right about that. We should. And he said, you know, I just don't know what going to McDonald's and eating hamburgers watching Mike Huckabee has to do with worshiping Jesus. I said, well, I don't think it has very much to do with it at all. And he let me know that he was offended that we went to McDonald's. The next Saturday, one of the guys in the church or next Sunday night said, hey, we're going to go to McDonald's. I said, I don't think we'll go tonight. Tried to stick around at the church and hang out there or go somewhere else or whatever, but uh, didn't want to exclude that guy. And so you know what happened? We quit going to McDonald's on Sunday nights and eating hamburgers and watching Mike Huckabee. Why? Well, Mike Huckabee's not really a pagan. He's not an independent fundamental Baptist, but he's not a pagan. And McDonald's hamburgers, as far as I know, aren't kosher or halal. <laughs> But somebody was offended, and it was better not to go there. It was better not to go there than to offend somebody. After he left our church, we went back to McDonald's. Amen! I 
because no one was offended by it anymore. Let's stand up. <laughs> it's good neither to Those eat drink ones. nor well let's let's come down to uh, verse twenty one to see it good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. It was the right thing to do, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Hast thou faith? <laughs> Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And if you don't believe it, it's not faith. If you don't believe it's right. Now I'm not saying we make things real, we believe things into reality. That isn't what the Scripture is teaching here at all. Friend, there is a real clear principle, and I hope that you can get it right now tonight. The principle isn't about the kind of meat or the kind of drink. The principle is about Jesus. Gentiles don't oughtn't to commit fornication because it's wicked. And it's a part of their wicked worship and brings up that fleshly appetite that they had for paganism. And eating meat offered to idols means something to them. So we'd better abstain from it. We've got to be careful about our Christian brother. Today, we've taken the term weaker brother and we use it as an insult. Mm -hmm. So it's an insulting term, isn't it? Well, brother, if you just don't believe it's right to drink wine, then I won't drink any with you tonight. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So I'm not into being a fool with you. It's not a weaker brother. Well, brother, if you really think that, you know, meat offered to idols is a big issue and you don't want to eat it, well, my, if you're the weaker brother, then I'll go with that. My friend, idols are wicked. And everything they represent is wicked. And if we're sanctified, we don't need to be part of it. Does it make sense? Of course, there's an underlying principle here that is way more, way deeper, and way more transcendent than a rule. As believers, we don't live by rules, do we? We don't have a, well, what am I allowed to do? That's about earning something, achieving something. The rule is, what am I? Who am I in Christ? We can look at Colossians chapter 2, and the Scripture tells us not to let any man judge us in respect to a, a new moon or a holy day or a Sabbath, and how that it talks about we're justified by faith and we stay saved by faith, and so don't let people Judaize us. But every bit as important as it was for the Gentile believers to not be Judaized by the Gentiles the Gentile believers needed to not offend the Jews. Because they're brethren in Christ. See, that's the entire theme of Romans if you were to study it. Study sometime Romans and analyze the phrase to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look at the makeup of the church at Rome. Jews who had fled persecution in Jerusalem living in Rome, who had preached the gospel to the Romans and now there are Gentiles and the church is a mixture. It's an admixture of Jews and Gentiles. And there's always this friction inside the church. Are we Jewish? Are we Gentile? What are we? And you've got the, the Gentiles pushing this way and the Jews pushing this way. And Paul writes the gospel explaining what the church is and the difference between Israel and the church. He concludes that all Israel is going to be saved. Someday we're going to be, we're going to be part of the Jewish kingdom. But this ain't it. And so salvation was by faith before the law. Before the law, Abraham was saved by faith. His faith was counted for righteousness. And so the gospel has always been salvation by faith. No one's ever been saved by the law. So you're not saved by what you do or what you do not do. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, whether he had already been on the cross or whether 
you are believing that he would be to the cross, whether it's past or present or future. Salvation is by faith, always has been. Paul dealt with that and also dealt with the promises that are for Israel. And his conclusion was, someday all Israel will be saved. And he's talking about national Israel in chapter 9, 10, and 11. He says, his kinsmen according to his flesh who don't believe in Jesus. They'll be saved one day. They'll be part, a few of them, of a kingdom that we're all going to come and participate in. Guess what kind of a kingdom it'll be? Will it be a Gentile kingdom? No, it'll be a Jewish kingdom. And we'll be there as Gentiles, and we'll be acting pretty Jewish at that time because it'll be the first time that has ever been that anyone's ever been able to keep the law because it will come back in different bodies than the ones we live in now. We'll be free from sin. It'll be a wonderful thing. And the temple will be a different place. It'll actually be inhabited by Jesus. And Judaism will not be Judaism. There will be no Judaism. There will be worship of God. The true living God. And all the nations will worship God. And that's the future of it. And so what's the conclusion? Well, we're one in Jesus Christ, my friend. Jews or Gentiles, male or female, bond or free. I don't have to do anything to earn my salvation. I don't have to exclude anything to earn my salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nothing I do saves me. Nothing I do can take away my salvation. But what I do affects my brethren or can keep them from being saved. And that, my friends, is the crux of the matter. That's the transcendent truth. How we live matters. What we do matters. makes a difference. I'm not trying to live a certain way so that I can keep the law and earn my salvation. I'm trying to live a certain way because it affects it affects my testimony. It affects the testimony of Jesus Christ. There are more issues. We're going to be preaching our series on biblical separation in two weeks. We're going to start that series on Sunday morning. And we'll deal with a lot of the matters of testimony. We'll deal with a lot of matters of holiness and the importance of reflecting the character of Christ. But we don't do those things in order to be saved. See, the Judaizers were telling the Gentiles, unless you do these things, you're not saved. The Gentiles are saying, unless we do these things, then salvation means nothing, and they're both wrong. See, they're saved by faith, and what you do matters. Let's say that together. I'm saved by faith, and what I do matters. I'm saved by faith, and what I do matters. I'm saved by faith, and what I do matters. Why? Well, it'll affect me what I do and what you do. And it will affect you what I do. And that's important, isn't it? What's your motivation in what you do? What's your first consideration in what you do? Hey, listen, I need to be holy, don't I? That's what I am. And I need to live like what I am. But you know what else? You need me to be holy. And I need you to be holy. Because what we do matters. We affect each other. You know, if we consider that, figuring out what's right and what's wrong isn't so difficult. Is it? Do you throw an issue out there? And if we consider others determining what's right and what's wrong, it isn't that hard. There are many things in my life that I could do, but I will not do. Because people mean too much. To Jesus... And so they mean a lot to me too. I wanted to get further. I wanted to cover some things, but we don't have time for it tonight, so let's end there. Father, thank you for what you taught us from the Scripture this evening. And I pray that this truth that we've learned about living for Jesus and living for others would transcend our selfish nature. We ask in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Let's take some prayer requests before we dismiss, shall we?